um, way that we, um, the method of fishing, um, the photograph behind you is a whole lot of, um, well, um, fairy prions and probably a couple of other things in there. They come in in the um, spring and feed on the krill that the um, mackerel have um, fired up to the surface. The persinas from down south come up and wipe out the complete um, school of fish and the birds are all sort of roaming around there thinking, what the hell can we have for lunch now? Um, so, you know, the question is, is there any method, like on the, the other people that are um, spoke are sort of saying like the threat to the um, bird life out in the Gulf is rats and cats and things, but it's, you know, the fishermen, the methods of fishing, um, personing, I think, in New Zealand is, um, it's a wonderful method of fishing, but it's just too intrusive. It takes out in quite entire schools of fish, um, which leaves everything else there, there devastated. Okay. Good luck, John. <coughs> Glenn? Uh, Start off. Yeah, I could talk about it for quite a long time, but I guess, uh, well, the first thing we need to recognise is there are uh, quite a number of fishermen who is much, uh, who's, who it is a, a problem for them. Uh, I don't think any fisherman wants to catch birds, and they themselves are, are trying to be quite innovative. And I've been on fishing boats and looked at some of their, uh, the ways that they're trying to avoid birds. The problem is we... Oh, taking out the food source. Yes. Um, there is... <coughs> one of the problems we've got is we, we don't... Setting the TACs is not an exact science. 75% of our fisheries, there's no formal or detailed assessment. We don't know what's going on. So we could be fishing those down to such a low level, it's having a massive impact on the wider ecosystem, not just what we like to eat, but also what birds and other things like to eat. And there is... Um, and, and to kind of put it in perspective, and this is a, a pet issue of mine, since 1990, f funding for fisheries research has gone down by 45%. Yep. The number of, of stocks have gone up 3.5-fold. And essentially the whole of the world's fourth largest EZ is reliant on less than $20 million research funding. It's crazy. We don't know what's going on. We know that there's not enough research funding. We know so little about what, what the ecosystem. Is it having an impact? Uh, from accounts from fishermen that have talked to me, yes, it is. It's definitely having an impact on... Um, there is research on having an impact on mammals. It's got to be having an impact on birds. Mm, and we know of some situations where certain populations are slowly starving to death. Mm. Steph, do you want to answer, respond to it as well? Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a huge challenge. I don't know. Um, it's, it's a huge challenge to quantify. Um, uh, we need to do more diet studies, but then actually um, attributing something like that to a d specific decline is, um, yeah, it is challenging. But I mean, with. We need more monitoring. We need more. We, we need more research dollars, and I think that's probably the theme that will come out of today. Is just we need more money, um, and to be able to understand how these threats uh, are affecting seabirds, and it's it's challenging to evaluate because they're they're so far away, and and how do you count these? Um, how do you count the birds when they're dying at sea? I mean, that's one of the bigger challenges of my work is you don't know what happens to birds when they die at sea, and so collecting them, and we don't have very good population estimates, so we need to get better population estimates and um, more detailed diet studies, I think, and tracking data as well. But also more monitoring on those fishing vessels. Um, I think that would help as well, to know where they're going and where they're interacting and doing some spatial analysis on, on where birds are foraging and where these fisheries are. Yeah. Other questions? Over here, yes. 
microphone's coming round. So, coming your way, here it is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the two questions on the, uh, the gannets. First of all, is is there predator control at Murawai? And secondly, uh, what's happened to all the gannets on the rock east at the end of Waiheke? They used to be covered in gannets and they've all left, I think. Does anybody know? Well, Murawai first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm afraid I don't know very much regards any sort of colony on Waiheke. Um, I'd have a little bit of a look at some, some data. Someone had mapped all of the different colonies around New Zealand. I don't know if um, that's changed uh, in terms of the one on Waiheke since, since that mapping was done. But in terms of pest control out at Murawai, um, there was an evaluation that um, dogs and often uh, marine plastic can be some of the uh, major issues for the gannets. Um, I know there has been, uh, when the gannets aren't there and the point is clear, um, some of the volunteers have gone down and cleaned up some small amounts of plastic that's ended up on the colony, and I've certainly seen stuff that's fallen down there due to um, visitors and things. But in terms of pests, I think dogs have been quite quite a big threat for the gannets, actually. Um, I've never seen any down there my, myself. And there is pretty um, extensive trapping done around um, the bush by the park rangers in that area who handle a lot of that. And there's a lot of lions that are quite closely monitored in the uh, Murawai bush area. It is a regional park. Um, so that, that's my understanding of how pests are being treated out in Murawai. I would say large, largely quite well. They monitor it pretty closely. Great. Another question at the back. Yes? Early February, so uh, clearly the end of the breeding season, there were probably about two to three hundred chicks, but clearly most of them had left by that particular okay. um, stage. That helps answer the question about the Waiheke. Thank you. Question. Thanks for that clarification. More questions? Yes, over here. And the, thank you. Uh, my question is about uh, fisheries management. Um, I was involved with um, the Mount Albert Research Centre way back when we were, had a um, fish processing section in the days of the orange ruffy, and um, we all know what happened to the orange ruffy stocks. So my, my um, comment or question would be, why is it always that the scientists must prove that the fisheries are having an effect on these things? Why is it not that the fishers, why should they not have to prove that they are not affecting the ecosystem? Why are we not employing the precautionary principle? If we don't know, why are we not being more careful? That's a good question, and I think it's aimed at Glenn. <laughs> I think that's a really good question. It, it kind of tips it on its head. Yes, what happened to the orange ruffy is no different to what happened to the Newfoundland um, cod fishery, the famous collapse in 92, it put 40,000 fishermen out of business overnight when the government um, shut it down. Because, and why that happened, exactly the same thing in the Ruffy, the industry self-reported data, catch effort data, what we used for the stock assessments, was the industry argued, our data's right, the scientists are in, in loony land and they don't know what they're talking about. They've never been on a fishing boat and they wouldn't know what a roughie looked like if they fell over it. Um, and that kind of, and with very powerful lobbying by some very um, powerful people to directly to politicians um, has the air of the day. Uh, maybe another way that could be done, instead of tipping it on its head, and this is what Iceland have done, they've created a marine institute, has, um, and the universities are, are the central leg of the stall. The other one being the politicians and, and the marine scientists. And they, when they make a, a decision or determination on a stock assessment, it is not for the politician to procrastinate over it, subject himself to lobbying, and then say, oh, no, I don't think we'll go with that. 
industry don't like it, it's just implemented, that's it. But here, we do all the scientific data and then, oh, let's have a debate about it. And by the way, because it's a big fishery, let's run a bit of a sniff test and ring everybody up and say, what do you think of this? Hmm. And then they go, yeah, let's, let's raise the quota. So we, we need to kind of reset it and, and maybe, um, yeah, we need to look at things differently. So I like your question. Yeah. <laughs> it's one solution. That goes to the idea of, of reviewing um, what we're doing with our fisheries management. Uh, my, just to add to that, is that the, um, the present act actually has a precautionary bit in it, but that has been successfully challenged by the fishing industry because, you know, the QMS is about ownership of quota and it's a, it's a property right. And that was, that was challenged back in the early 2000s um, and, and it didn't work for the environment. It went the wrong way. And so, so we do need to re reset things, um, if, you know, and it was just part of that thing about a review. It's time to, it's time to, to rethink um, how we manage things.